This is the golden question. Hello, hello guys. Welcome to episode 7 of the Golden Question Podcast. In today's episode, we're going to be answering the question, what is the role of companies in an economy? Or what's the role of of companies in an economy? And unfortunately, people today in society are deviating from the truth uh, and deviating from the actual answer of that question. Uh, You know, the... The conventional wisdom, and I hate to use that word because the conventional wisdom implies that the that the majority is wise, but unfortunately that's not the case. So I'm using that term just to express the, the conventional uh, thought that society as a whole bears. And the role of companies, they claim, should be to provide jobs. And that is the only role of companies. And you see this being perpetuated by politicians because, you know, the reason why they justify these bailouts for these companies is so that the workers can retain their jobs, right? If you, if you, because, you know, liberals, they, they like to bash corporations, major corporations. Um, However, when it comes to saying well, they employ hundreds of millions of people, or not hundreds of millions of people, but corporations as a whole employ a lot of people. Um, all of a sudden, they start, you know, they start changing their attitudes a bit when it comes to the workers. And you know, they they always, whenever they talk about business, they always zone in on the worker as if the worker is the main subject of the corporation. And if you were to ask any uh, liberal, what's the role of business, they would most likely give you the answer to provide jobs for workers or to provide jobs. And they see that, you know, what's the whole point of providing jobs? Why can't the workers just work for themselves and and have, uh, um, you know the company structured in a way that it's it just revolves around the workers the company the main objective of the company is to provide uh, an environment for the worker to work however again and that's the marxist ideology but unfortunately there are several problems with with having that type of mindset and having that view on corporations and it could lead to to very severe consequences if you actually enact with the with those ideologies and we'll briefly discuss because i don't want this getting too long you know i could write a whole book on this and maybe you know i might that might be the the ultimate end game for me is to compile my thoughts on these podcasts uh and then formulate them to in a format of a book you know with chapters and, and what have you so let's go ahead and start discussing now I'm going to start off with the example of the baker. Uh, I think Adam Smith made this example in in The Wealth of Nations. Or if this was just a quote, I'm not sure. I'm going to have to double check. But he said that a baker, when when the baker first got into the business of baking, and again, he's writing this in the time of, you know, the the late 1700s, basically in, in the 18th century. But it's, still, it's, it's surprising how it's still relevant today. So he said that the baker, when he bakes, he, his first intention is to benefit himself. He One day he woke up and he asked himself, how can I benefit myself? How can I improve my standard of living? How can I acquire more goods and services that I don't have yet now? And the way to do that is to provide a good and service to others, to society. So in effect, what he's doing is because he's benefiting society, he also benefits himself. And in fact, it should be, it, it's actually the other way around. It's because he's benefiting himself, in effect, he's benefiting society. 
So the benefiting society part is the unintended consequence that there is as a result of him benefiting himself. Now he can benefit himself at the expense of society by stealing other people's money, by robbing people, by forcing them to give him money. In that sense, he's benefiting himself at the expense of other people. But an even better way is to benefit himself and to benefit others. And by benefiting himself, it's a more efficient way and he can accumulate more wealth that way rather than to benefit himself at the expense of others. I mean, and again, this you could apply this to any format, right? As For example, if a kid wants to I mean, you could set this up. I'm surprised they don't do these in, in school where you could set it up as, as an experiment where you have kids sitting in a classroom and, you know, have the kids acquire more wealth. Tell them, all right, I'm going to give you guys toys. All right, I'm going to give you guys Legos. And then who can acquire the most Legos at the end? And I'm just going to give you guys just the bare the, the Lego pieces, the individual Lego blocks. And what you'll see is that the kids will realize, wait a second, if we're if I'm just giving up my Legos and somebody's giving me Legos, that's not doing anything. Because then everybody will still have the net same amount. However, if I use my Legos to build something, then I'm able to acquire more Legos. Because a, a, a Lego set that's fully built is more valuable than just sparse Legos. And then in that sense, somebody might actually exchange more Legos, individual pieces, for a smaller set of Legos that are already compiled. And in that sense, a person could, at while he's benefiting others by giving them a fully completed set of Legos, he is acquiring more Legos than he would. So his, his input is less uh, than his output. He's, he's, his output is greater. So that's just a small example, but you can apply it to the economy as a whole. Anybody who wants to benefit himself, he has to benefit others. And that's the unintended consequence. His his inclination at first is not to benefit others. That's actually just a consequence, the unintended. It's not intentional that he benefits others. And that's the legitimate way to 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 benefit yourself. And in, and it's actually the most efficient way to benefit yourself. So back to the example of the baker. You have the baker who wants to benefit himself. So in order to benefit himself, he's creating baked bread, let's say, for example. And when he creates baked bread, he's benefiting society. He's providing society with bread, something that society uh, was, let's say, for example, there was no other baker around. So society was missing out on, on baked bread, and he's now providing society with that baked bread. So society's benefiting because they have baked bread and then now he's also benefiting because people are willing to trade something of value to them back to the baker so now the baker is acquiring more goods and in that sense both parties are benefiting now let's say he wants to benefit himself even further right he's working by himself baking bread he can only bake a certain amount of bread let's say he can bake 10 pieces of bread every hour let's just say I don't, I don't know how accurate that is but let's say he can bake 10 pieces of bread every hour um so he's only benefiting 10 people let's say one person buys one piece of bread so in order for him to benefit himself even further and to benefit society even further because now more people can buy bread because right now he's only outputting 10 pieces of bread an hour if he can produce more pieces of bread per hour he can benefit more people uh, for society and he can also benefit himself by acquiring more wealth that way he'll have to hire somebody to help him uh, double let's say for example his output from 10 to 20 so now when he hires someone he's actually benefiting three parties he's benefiting himself now because he's acquiring more wealth because he's selling more pieces of bread he's benefiting society the consumer, the people who are actually benefiting by this good, they're getting more bread, more people are getting bread, and he's benefiting the worker. Now the worker now is, is having uh, uh, the salary and, and the income. And the worker now could use that salary and income to, to do other things. So it the intention is never to benefit others. It's oh, The intention starts off with how do I benefit myself? And then 
the, the consequences, the positive consequences follow. Because he's benefiting himself, he's benefiting others, and he's benefiting, uh, well, yeah, he's benefiting others, and by that he's benefiting the consumers because now they're getting a finished good, and he's benefiting also his workers. And if you look at the way that the company is structured, right? If you have shareholders who own the company, they own portions of the company, they're the company owners, they want to benefit themselves. How do they do that? They have to provide more goods and services to, to people. And if you go back to the example of the baker, how is the baker doing? How is the baker essentially doing that? How is he benefiting others? He's providing a good or service, but in this case, it's a good. He's providing baked bread. If you remove baked bread from that equation, he can't benefit society, right? He can hire that worker, but if that worker isn't making anything of value to the consumers, there, there's no point in running the business. So it's be, it's because he's benefiting consumers, not and and he's giving the consumers bread and he's acquiring wealth because of that he's able to hire somebody so and and i specifically put it in that order for a reason and adam smith put it in that order for a reason you start off with the baker who wants to benefit himself he benefits the consumers by giving them bread he's benefiting others and then he can be able to employ workers he can't start off by employing workers first because then those workers won't have anything to do so just apply this to the com- on a scale of a company. The company's shareholders, the owners of the company, want to benefit themselves. How do they benefit themselves? By creating goods and services. How do they do that? By em- employing workers to help them do that work for them. So you can see what's happening here. It's the, the ownership of the company has, has a vision in what society wants. And that's the risk. The right there... They, the, the, the owners of the company inherit the risk. And the risk is, what does society want? Now, how do you do that? What you, you do is you take on risk. You, it's not really gambling. You're just taking a risk on deciding what society wants. And I wouldn't consider that gambling at all. I would consider that just taking a chance. Okay? It's like... Um, you know, there's a door. If I open the door, that thing might bite me or it might reward me and reward others, let's say. Because remember, when you're taking the risk, you're rewarding others also. I might as well open the door because if there's something good, it rewards others. If there's something bad, I get bit, but I'm willing to take that chance. So the shareholders are willing to take the chance, the risk to benefit society. So in the event that they don't benefit society, there is a loss. They lose money. Okay, so they get punished for not correctly finding a good or service that benefits society and a good or service that society wants. And if they do find a good or service society wants, then they could hire the workers and then they could uh, be- benefit you know the workers as well. But it first has to start off with the owners finding what benefits society. That's where the money is, finding the idea. The, the intuition to actually come up with a good, right? Steve Jobs, when he first started, he had to say, okay, he had to sit down and say, what does society want? And then he can go ahead and, and start, you know, making models of, 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 of the good. And then he could hire people to make those goods for him. The idea that we could just have the workers do everything, the workers are there to produce, but what are you going to produce? You need somebody to actually plan out and take the risk who has savings. Again, it all starts off with the savings initially, but I'm, I'm bypassing that. It initially starts off with the savings. Somebody accumulated wealth, and then they say, you know what? I'm going to use this wealth to take a risk. That risk is, let's see if I can guess and, 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 and making an educated guess, right? There has to be research involved in what society wants. And then I could hire the worker. So it always starts off with the inclination of the person. How do I benefit myself? How do I acquire more wealth? They're basically using the wealth that they have to acquire more wealth. In that, they're taking a risk. They're making an idea, a guess, in which, uh, in which some, it, to create something that benefits society. 
and I'm sorry, but initially they're trying to benefit themselves, but because they're benefiting themselves, they need to find a way to benefit others. So they have to formulate the idea and then they could hire workers to help them enact that idea. So workers are important, but they're not the end game and they're not the, the starter of this process. The starting of the process, the initiation of the process from, from a, to, to end in creating a good or service that benefits society, it starts off with the person taking on the risk to create a good or service that benefits society, just the idea and formulating the idea, right? He could obviously hire people to help him formulate the idea, but essentially the idea starts with him. The workers would do are useless without the person who takes on the risk with this capital to formulate the idea. Because again, the workers are working for something. They're working to provide a good or service to the consumer, okay? But how are they gonna get that good and service? They have to get it from an idea, a mind, an initial mind, and it's most likely one person, right? It's hard to formulate ideas when you have a lot of people. It it's always starts off with one person who creates something in their mind. And again, you can, there's always exceptions. You can't have people as a group collectively create a good, but it, but there's always, in that sense, there's always disputes, uh, you know, who came up with that idea, stuff like that. But it always starts off with, with most of the time with one person who has an idea and then he enacts that idea and then he hires workers. So the workers are sort of the middle phase of, of, of the business process. They're not the beginning. It doesn't start off with the worker creating the good or service. Well, what is the good or service that they're creating? It has, you're missing the, the, the step before that in which the good or service has to be created. And again, the end game of the company is not to hire workers, right? If I make up, if I decide to make up uh, an idea for a company, my goal isn't, let me just hire as many workers as possible. It's let me provide a good or service that benefits society. And me hiring workers is just a process, is a step of the process, and it's an intended consequence. Because obviously I can't create the good or service. I mean, I can physically uh, go and operate the machine and, and uh, create the good or service, but I can't do it alone. I would be much more efficient if I hired a lot of other people doing it for me, which will help me increase my wealth. But at the same time, I'm hiring people. I'm, I'm creating wealth for them also. But you, people are missing the process, right? Either they think that the process starts off with uh, the workers, in which it always starts off with the workers just creating goods and services. But again, it's it's the creation of new goods and services that benefit society, and you have to have an idea first. I mean, you can create food, you can uh, create simple objects, right? That really are not that complex, but you'll you'll be surprised on how complex even the creation of a pencil is. And again, there is a there is an example of uh, this. I forgot who it was, but somebody uh, described how how many different factors it takes to create a pencil, right? You need the the paint, the wood, and, and again, I think even Ben Shapiro made the example with the example uh, with the pencil. Uh, but again, it's a, it's used it because it's a famous example. But just something as simple as a pencil requires so many different factors that it's not just the workers all creating a pencil. It's a bunch of different companies and their own. Um, owners who who decide I'm going to create the paint another person says I'm going to create the wood another person says I'm going to create the lead and then one person at the end then takes those collective goods and then formulates them into a pencil so there's a bunch of different factors it's not just one worker it's it's not just a bunch of workers um saying you know what I'm going to I'm going to create a pencil and then they just magically collectively create a pencil and again, we can't get it. And again, it's it's funny how this also leads into the idea of individualism, because you have the the owner of the company who is who is one guy, most of the time, and he's the one who creates an idea. It's not a collective idea because collective ideas never work. In my, with the experience that we've seen, you never see just a a group of fifty people create a good or service that benefits others. You know, it's always starts off with one individual who has an idea and then he, he ends up benefiting others. 
and in that sense, it's it's the individual idea that initiates this process. It's the individual, not a collective group of people. And there are a bunch of, I guess, psychological factors that, that might explain why a group is less efficient in creating uh, something than a collective. I mean, just look at the, the music, right? Um, looking at uh, artists, right? Artists create something because it's an individual creating something, right? When I paint a painting, it's me painting that painting, just me. Imagine a group of people painting one painting. I mean, you're, there has to be a person to coordinate that, right? If, if 10 people just started painting on a painting, nobody would have any idea. You would have to have one person say, all right, you're going to do this. We're going to do, you're going to do that. And they're all going to agree to it. So even in that sense, if you have a group of people painting uh, a, a painting, there's always going to be a person that says, you know what, all right, you're going to do this and is who's going to assign the roles. And he's the individual mind who has the, the final image also. And again, they're going to have to agree on a final image, but that, that person who gave the idea for the final image started off with one person, not a collective group. So, and again, this, this, this is the whole point why we have team leaders, right? You can't just have a soccer match without the coach. The coach has to, has to give the idea for everybody or else everybody would just be running chaotically. There has to be an initial person, an individual, who sets the idea, and then others follow. So, so the idea that the the companies just start off with the workers, the worker is is the input, and then they create all the goods and services for us. Yes, but that's a sh that's a very short-minded way of looking at things. It doesn't just start off with the worker. It starts off with an individual who has an idea. Who then enacts on that idea and in order for him to achieve those ideas he hires other people and unfortunately that's an aspect that people are missing now again comp now when a company incorporates what they do is they allow other owners to to come into to the company so in in in, in that sense it's also benefiting because now he's not solely uh, reaping the benefits of the company. He's uh, he's able to share his company with others and more and more people are allowed to collectively um, uh, own the business. And, and I would argue the business sometimes becomes less efficient in that sense. But in a, if, the comp if those owners now elect some individual to run the company, such as the CEO or they, they have a board, in that sense, the, again, they're diverting their their knowledge and their their um, their mind to one individual. So even if you have a bunch of shareholders, they're not the ones making decision because there wouldn't be any decisions passed because everybody is going to want have a different vision of the company, and no one person is they're they're, they're not going to come to a collective agreement. They're going to have to elect someone to to do those decisions for it. So in a sense. When a company incorporates, it's also benefiting because now the ownership of the company is not with just one individual. That individual is now sharing his company. That's why they're called shares, right? Stock is just a bunch of shares. You own a share in the company. He's willing to, to make his company public. And in that sense, he's allowing others to own the company with him and he's sharing the benefits. He could just keep the company, uh, he could just benefit himself, but he it's going to be more efficient for him to share his company with others. And in that sense, he can increase the wealth for himself because now the company will have more uh, more funding. And in that sense, the company could generate uh, more profits and then those get distributed to the shareholders. Now he's sharing his wealth. So essentially, it's the, the it's a huge process, right? The The formation of a successful company is a massive process. And again, let me run through it real quick. You have the, the individual. It always starts off with one individual, a person who has an idea. He then either maybe he makes and a lot of people, they, they start working themselves, right? If I want to start a, a lemonade stand, I, have to, I first start off with the lemonade stand. It's going to be very hard to convince others to work for me when I don't know how to make lemonade myself, right? That's why the owners of these companies, they have to know their actual business. But you have an individual who has an idea to do something. 
and he has the pro the, he has to formulate a, a, a model for others to follow. Then he hires others. Oh, so he first formulates the model. He has to invest in capital. Um, he has capital to invest to buy to buy all the 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 tools. Also, that's that's why we have tools to make our make our um, uh, labor more efficient. You have the individual who who makes the risk, makes the investment, and then once other people start benefiting from that, then he can hire more workers. So now he's benefiting himself, society, and workers. And then when he benefits, and then when that goes through, and then he he benefits society even more, and society wants to demand more, he can, and again, he's going to need more funding, he can now look to sharing his company with other individuals. And when he shares his company with other individuals, he's putting more money into the company, and then that, that company could then... Uh, produce even more goods and services uh, to to benefit societies. So it starts off with the individual, then it goes to the individual with the workers, and then it goes to the individual, the workers, and the shareholders. And in the meanwhile, the core of it is the consumer. It's who is buying the goods and services. And essentially, if you if you if people were asked, what's the whole point of a middle class, right? You have the the higher class, the middle class, and the lower class. Or the rich, the middle class, and the lower class. The lower class are the workers. The middle class are the buyers who buy the goods and services that the lower class produces. Because if the lower class just produces a bunch of these goods, who's going to buy these goods? And again, it doesn't start off with them buying them. It starts off with the hot, the, the rich, the higher class, who's going to invest and take on the risk to provide a benefit to society to provide a benefit for the middle class and then they use the lower class to help them provide that benefit and the lower class is also getting employed that way so that's the structure of an economy essentially and a lot of people are not understanding this they think that the economy either the main uh, the economy starts off with the workers so they throw away the, the guy who has the idea they just have workers working for I don't know what they're just I don't know how they formulate new ideas Right? How, how are 100 workers going to collectively think of, of, of an idea to, to produce something? It doesn't work. You have to have one individual who thinks of an idea. Or they have the false impression that the company is all about employing workers. Like that's the end game. The end game is just let's employ workers. Well, how do you employ workers without providing a benefit to society first? You have to provide the benefits to society first or you have to make the risk, the investment, and the intention to benefit uh, yourself first, that consequently benefits society, and then you're able to hire workers to help you benefit society. Because the only reason why you're hiring workers is to help you benefit society even more, which consequently benefits you even more. And now the consequence of not following this business process and government stepping in. So there's and there's many different aspects of this. So what's, what we're seeing now is when a company fails, we're gonna have to bail it out. And the question is, why is the company failing? You have to ask yourself that, right? Whenever you help something, if you wanna solve the problem, you have to understand what the problem is. And a company could be failing for a number of reasons. They have poor management. They aren't making a good or service that benefits society. Um, their expenses are too high, right? They're not correctly allocating resources because again, your expenses are your resources that you're bringing in. And if you're bringing in too many resources and you're not having a net positive output, you're actually wasting resources because you're acquiring a larger portion of value and you're converting it into something that has even lesser value, even lower value. And that's the definition of a loss in which your expenses exceed your revenue. Okay, so your revenue is what's being outputted, the value that's being created, and your expenses is the input, what you're acquiring. If you have a loss, what, you're, what that essentially means is that you're taking something that has a lot of value and you're converting it into something that has lower value. 
That's the whole definition of a loss. A profit, on the other hand, is when you take something of lower value and you convert it into something of greater value. Your revenue exceeds your expense. So the, the, the general consensus now is, oh, profits are bad. We need to ban profits. Well, what's going to happen? How The profit, again, is just a tool to tell you how much you're benefiting society. And there's different ways you could look at it. You could just simply look at it as the more money, the more profits I make, the more value I'm creating. So let's say my expenses are constant. Let's keep expenses as the constant. If my output, the greater my output is, the greater the uh, the, the value I'm providing which is just the way you could tell if something has value is the price. How much people are willing to sacrifice to acquire that, that good or service. So let's say my expenses are $10, my output is $30, my profit is 20. However, if my expense is still $10 and my output is $40, my profit is $30. So my expense is still constant, I'm still uh, taking something that has a value of ten dollars, but now I'm converting it into something that has even more value. So the greater my profit is, the greater my output is, and the greater I'm benefiting society. The more I'm benefiting society. So it, the, what the government says is, you know what? Even if you're not producing a benefit to society, even if you're taking something of greater value and you're converting it into something of lower value, you're you could still operate as a business and I'm gonna make up for that difference. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna bail you out. But that's not how it works because now you're you're wasting resources. You might as well have been better off not creating that good or service in the in the first place because the the input to that uh, to that process had greater value. Right? If I'm taking a cup that has a value of ten dollars and converting it into something of less value and maybe that's worth five dollars I was better off with the cup because the cup had more value and when I converted it into something else that has lower value I'm losing out because now I lost the thing that has greater value so when a when a comp when a government bails out companies they're actually wasting resources because they're taking things that have greater value and they're converting it into something that has lower value and to think that they're that they're uh, creating the thing that they're uh, inputting is finite in resources, right? The whole idea of economy is that the earth is all we've got. The resources on this earth is, is everything we've got. If we consume all the resources, then there are no other resources left, right? There's a finite number of metals in the earth. There's a finite number of everything, right? Technically, you could uh, have an equation that sums up all the elements in the earth. But there's a finite number. There's not an infinite number of resources. So the person who wins is the person who can successfully create those finite resources and make the most out of them. And that's the whole definition of being efficient. You can make the most of what you have. All right? If I give somebody um, a certain number of things, let's say I give him 10 pieces of marbles and he has to create something valuable with that and I give somebody else 10 pieces of marbles and one person creates something more valuable than the other, the person who didn't create something valuable, he wasted resources. And he waste, he could have had the potential to create something more value because somebody else created something more value. So the difference between them is the potential that that person lost out on and the, the potential that the society lost. So. When you remove profits from the equation, when you bail out companies, you're basically allowing them to waste more resources. Because the reason why they're not, they need the bailout is because they're not creating something that's beneficial to society, or they're not creating it in a way that uses the least amount of expenses. And believe it or not, salaries are part of that expense. If a if a company is all about paying workers, they could be paying their workers a million dollars an hour and now they have no profits, they're not creating something of value, and and society gets worse off. Because again, he is, the only way for a business to, is able to afford paying their workers a lot of money, and 
by not increasing the price of their goods and services to consumers because consumers again they want value they want to trade their value for something of, of equal value and that thing that they're trading they want to get the most value of it as possible because if they see that it's not valuable they're not going to buy it so the only way for a business to afford to pay their workers um, uh, a lot of money right more money than they should by not changing the 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 revenue by not changing the price of the goods and services is for the person to actually take some of his own money and pay it to the workers because otherwise there would be no way for him to fund the salaries of his workers however the money that he's now just giving to the workers he could have he could have uh used that money to you know to to better invest in the company and to provide more goods and services because when you pay your workers you're not when you pay your workers more you're not contributing to to the to to providing value for the for for the consumers right if i pay my workers 10 extra dollars that well one of my workers 10 extra dollars society isn't getting a benefit right he's getting a benefit but society the goods and services that i'm creating that's the end game nothing changes right if i'm not changing the prices now the way that the the company works is let's say the workers demand more salaries okay i'm going to pay them more salaries but in order for them to in order for them to receive funding for their salaries i'm going to have to raise the prices and if i raise the prices the consumer might not value the good or service i'm producing at that price and then they'll stop buying the the good or service and now there is no company now i i the company clo- the company shuts down and now the workers lose their jobs so because i'm paying them more would they rather have no job or a job with the salary that's that's best fit for them and if you demand more salary for the if the workers demand more salary you 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 the only way you can fund that is to increase prices and if you increase prices you might not get the revenue to fund for those salaries so again it's always uh the revenue that must come in is going to be the revenue that goes to 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 invest in the company and to provide salaries but the the revenue if the company uses the revenue to invest in the company they can actually benefit more people because now they can create more goods and services and one way again is to hire more workers or to to pay the workers more if they're if they can somehow increase their productivity or using the revenues to uh, build more factories uh, provide more tools so the if you look at the company the end game is to provide more goods and services of the company the end game isn't to pay the workers more and again the sentiment now is we have to make the we have to bail out these companies because if we don't bail them out then the workers are going to get fired they're going to lose their jobs well the reason why the company is not not making money it's because it's on it's on the level of the consumer the consumer is not valuing the company and when the consumer doesn't value the company the 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 losses that they have is a signal telling them to stop what they're making the market is essentially telling you stop what you're doing because you you're wasting resources you're taking something of greater value and you're converting it into something of a lower value so the, when you have losses the market tells you stop what you're doing and then you have to stop what you're doing you have the business now the the owners lose money because they didn't correctly value uh the the goods and services at the at a level equitable to the consumers so now they they lose money on the investment they lose money now a new company is going to form right they they can go bankrupt they could sell all their their assets at whatever the fair value is and now a new company could form that is more efficient and those workers could look for other jobs or they could work for the new company that formed now that they they have skills so and it's again and, and it's not their fault that the company went bankrupt it's because the 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 owner of the company didn't correctly assess what he's producing or and, and didn't value it correctly so now when you when you say all right workers need to be part of the company part of the owners now the, the workers have to face the losses because they're the ones who are also making the decisions the the good thing about working and and having a wage is that you're not responsible for the losses you're just following somebody else's decision so if something goes wrong it's that person's 
uh, fault because he's the one who made the decision that eventually made things go wrong with the company. So and and that's that also goes uh, with part of the risk. The person who has the risk, who takes the risk, is the one that gets blamed for if something goes wrong. And when you say workers need to own part of the company and they need to be at the forefront of the company, they're they're the ones who are going to create all the goods and services. They're the ones who are, who are going to inherit the risk. And, and people today in society don't understand the risk that it takes to, to go into a business and don't understand that the reason why these workers are working for them to, in the first place is because they don't want to take the risk, right? They could just start their own businesses, but they don't want to risk it. They're not willing to take the risk, right? There's, there's always a consequence to acquiring wealth is that there's risk on the other hand, right? I want as many things for myself as possible, but there's a lot of risk in that. And if one person says, you know what, I'm willing to take the risk because I have enough capital, then they could go ahead and take the risk. But if they don't have a lot of capital and they're not willing to risk lose it all, uh, they would rather work for, for somebody. And the benefit in working is yeah, you'll get paid less, but you, there's no risk involved. So hopefully I summed up everything. I, I know this is probably going to be one of my longest podcasts ever, but I sort of wanted to explain the business pri- the business model, the business process how capitalism is supposed to work and different ways in which the the sentiment the the the, the general sentiment is shifting in in in, in a incorrect way uh, and the the consequences unfortunately that we're going to face so and again the problems that we have in the country now are governmental right you have government acquiring power and government becoming inefficient that's one aspect of it you have government gaining power through the Federal Reserve, through printing money, right? The government is basically saying, you don't have to work, we'll just give you the money. And then you have the actual fundamental problem with our economy in which we're not following the the rules of capitalism. We're not following the rules of the free market. We're warping the rules. We're, we're, we're doing things that are sort of not in agreement with the policies, essentially. And we're running on uh, false claims right the idea that the workers should be at the forefront of the company the idea that the end game of a company is just to provide jobs is just to provide money but what they don't understand is all right let's say the workers have more money what are they going to do with that money the only reason why they're getting the money so that they can have the another end of the of the transaction is for them to acquire good and service but if they just have the money money isn't going to do you any good and essentially that's the lesson and it's really the, the irony in this i'm going to end this podcast with with just a simple irony the irony here is that the left thinks that capitalism the uh, the free market is all about greed they think that they don't care about other people they only care about themselves and that's a negative thing but in fact the greed actually lies with their ideology their ideology essentially states that we should just be giving as much money to people so people shouldn't uh, try to acquire goods and services they shouldn't produce goods and services they should just get as much money as possible with, with the least amount of work essentially that's the equation let me get the mo- most amount of possible uh, money possible with the least amount of work but what they don't understand is that if they don't work they're not going to produce the goods and services that could that they could use to buy uh, with the money that they have their, all, their end goal is just to provide more money right all these laws minimum wage, unemployment, all these socialist laws are all about getting more money in your pocket. It's not about creating more goods and services that benefit society because when you have money in your pocket, you're only benefiting yourself. What you do with your money in your pocket and and the goods and services that you create is the whole thing that drives the economy, right? The whole idea of of the left's ideology is, and I'm going to say it again, is to just get money in your pocket. And you could see this, all the the benefits is to get more money in your pocket. All the minimum wage, get more money in your pocket. It's all about just shove as much money in your pocket as possible and then just go out and buy goods and, goods and services, consume the goods and services. It's not, not about producing more goods and services. You never hear a liberal say, we need to produce more goods and services in society. All they talk about is acquiring more wealth, acquiring more money. That's all they talk about. But what they don't understand is that it's not about creating wealth. That's not the end game of an economy. The end game of an economy is to produce goods and services, all the goods and services that make our life better today than it was 
yesterday. It's the goods and services that matter. It's the actual tangible things that provide benefit to us that matters. And the left's goal is just to put more money in people's pocket. And the way to put more money in people's pocket is either to print it and to lower the purchasing power of the money that people currently have or to just simply tax it and steal it from other people. So it's just about them acquiring more money for themselves, but they don't understand that it's not about the money. The money is not the end of the equation sign of, of an economy. The end of the equation sign of an economy is the goods and services. And I'm going to end it with that. Hope you guys enjoyed listening to this uh, and stay safe.